Wow. It's an impressive panel of folks here. Michael, did you get your coffee? You set? He's got it. Perfect. Great. Um, well, sometimes we like to be early too, so maybe we'll we'll just get started. I see that um, all my guests are now here and they have their webcams turned on. Um, so let it roll. We actually uh, started a little bit earlier than we, we thought we would, but happy to kick this off. And uh, let's talk about today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna talk about overview, overview of the new rules set forth by the CRC, and we're talking here specifically about New Jersey. Um, how to successfully invest in and or start up a company, a banking needs to knows. I don't know if it should be banking need, needs to know or need, need to knows, but I think that's right. Legal advice and how to best position yourself for a license, financial modeling and budgeting and tax issues. And obviously uh, we are here from SACS bringing you this webinar on cannabis and uh, we're really excited about this. Uh, just a, a few notes. First, this is really for informational purposes. So you, we're gonna talk about the fact that you do need to assemble a team of experts when you're going through this whole process and you see um, many of the experts on this call and we, we're gonna actually talk about what an expert looks like, but you, you do need to consult them. So this is not legal advice or accounting advice. This is really just know some of our thoughts you should really consult a professional hopefully it will be us and this is one of many uh webinars we're going to have because this is kind of like a journey if you know our firm we've been around for 65 years and uh, we were the folks who were talking to you about the ppp the erc uh changes and rules from the beginning and so we're really excited to talk about the cannabis world and um i'm going to introduce myself in the panel, and then we're gonna get right into some exciting uh, questions. I want you to know too that you have the ability in the question section to post questions. I will be monitoring some of those questions, and uh, if we have time, we'll get through all of them, but uh, we have some, some things we do wanna cover. So my name is Todd Polanak. I'm a partner at SACS, and also I'm the practice leader of the SACS Capital, uh, SACS Cannabis Advisors. Um, also, to the, I guess to the, the right of me in my picture here is Adam Holzberg, who is a senior manager also in a cannabis practice. Uh, Dr. David Tunick, who is the CEO of UCS Advisors. Uh, John Meyer, who is with Valley uh, Bank. So you notice the trend here. We've got some accountants. We've got a serial entrepreneur. We have a banker. And then, of course, Michael McQueeny, who is with Holy Hoag. I said it right, Michael? That's like a, the Boston, yes, for sure. That's that's the way to say it. And um, you guys can unmute yourselves if you like, because I know you're uh, you're all muted. Um, and you know, as we're we're getting into the discussion, if you wanted to say a few words, I don't want to go through the typical. You know, you speak five minutes about yourself. As we're kind of going through things, just kind of share a little bit about your experience. But I want to kick it off with our my first burning question. So um, the the regulations came out last week, last last Thursday, uh, 164 pages. I think I've read it all once. I know Adam read it twice. Adam, did you read it three times at this point? I don't know. Not There's yet. a lot of information. <laughs> In, the, in those 164 pages. Again, this is New Jersey. So if you're tuning in from another state, we're talking about the New Jersey regs. Um, anything in there that was a surprise, not a surprise um, in the 164 pages of wonderful um, guidance from our state of New Jersey? Anyone want to yeah, comment? Yeah, I'll start off. I mean, and and just a little tip from from Adam. If you've only read it twice, you got to read it frontwards, then backwards to to fully understand it. But mm -hmm. um, but look, I mean, you know, j just to kind of contrast uh, New Jersey. Um, you know, I think there was there were certain things that that were going to be in there. The statute that we had for the enabling legislation was pretty specific. You know, to me, I think the one thing that that popped out resoundingly 
is the speed at which these this application cycle is going to move forward right so so in the history of new jersey we've had three application rounds to this point they've always been this uh they call them request for applications rfa but it's similar to an rfp or an rfq if if folks in the professional world are familiar with that which is hey look here's when the application opens here's when the application closes and we're going to wait to score until everything comes in i i think the big surprise that i, that I think a lot of us saw in the regs was that that process is going to change for New Jersey, right? So, so we, we might not necessarily have that 30 to 44, 45 day period that we've had in the past, which was a sprint in and of itself. In contrast, what the regulations identified was, hey, look, like as the CRC, we're going to open up a, an application round and, and you could theoretically submit your application on day one. And that becomes relevant in a number of different respects. I mean, you talk about cultivation, which obviously has a cap on the total number of licenses that will be available, but the notice itself will also limit the other types of licenses available. And, and the way the process is at least envisioned to roll out under the regulations, um, these applications are gonna be scored on a rolling basis. And the downside about that is not only are you gonna run out of uh, licenses at one point, but, but at some point when there's more fully scored applications, um, then there are licenses available. Folks are going to get thrust into the lottery, right? So I, I think the big surprise that came out was, you know, we know it's a sprint to submit an application. No matter, no matter how much time you have, you always need more time when it comes to submitting an application. But, but th this is certainly a new paradigm in New Jersey. Um, other states have lotteries, but I think this is even a new paradigm as compared to other states' lotteries. And I think speed to submission and i and candidly i think even starting to prepare what you think a responsive application is going to look like um i think that's going to be critical here in a way that certainly maybe the statute itself itself didn't envision so Steve, michael um good points and to the audience um i always like to do a quick introduction about myself because why would you say why should i listen to this guy wearing a hat right now and so my name is Dr. David Kunick. I'm the CEO and co-founder of UCS Advisors and Investor Relations. Um, I've actually been in the cannabis industry since 2009. I'm very blessed. I've started seven different cannabis companies in five different states. I actually took one of my companies public. Um, and I had uh, originally testing lab facilities in Vegas, Denver, and Portland, Oregon. Um, for all the audience participants here, I am in my hotel room here in Las Vegas. I'm actually at a cannabis conference at Michael, I don't know if you're still in Vegas or if you're back east, um, we just spoke at. Uh, John Meyer from Valley Bank. Valley Bank is actually one of the sponsors out here and I've actually met two people from Valley Bank out here and John, I'm gonna be stopping by your booth later today in Vegas. Um, and where I'm actually gonna slightly disagree with Michael right now, and this is why we're having this panel. As someone who started test, uh, cannabis companies in numerous states, if we were to look at the trend of states after they pass legalization, and after they do their first round of licenses, usually within 36 months, you see the state open up and they'll, you'll come and they'll become a new influx of additional licenses. And uh, Adam knows this, uh, especially for your background, Michael knows this as well too, that when you look at states within the first three years after they roll up legalization, the licenses, almost 50% of them run out of money or capital and need to start bringing in partners. So as much as people say, I wanna to rush to the industry and I have to get in first, you're not gonna miss the boat in my opinion, where if you have not been playing this for at least the last 18 months, not a year, but at least the last 18 months getting your team together and you're just getting organized now, you might be a little too late for this round, but not all together. So especially here in New Jersey, and the other thing here in New Jersey is that in 2018, we had a lawsuit for the medical licenses to be given out. That just got settled a few weeks prior to the legalization. Those licenses need to be given out. Those dispensaries, extraction labs, growth facilities need to occur. So over the next two or three years, we're going to see more licenses, in my opinion, still come out here in New Jersey. So if you don't get in on this round, it's not that you're out for good. This means you have to wait a little bit longer. So I think Michael brings a really good point and unique aspect, but you know we got to look past the hood of the car. So I just want to add that that little aspect, and this is why we're doing this panel discussion. This is why uh, Sachs Cannabis put this together to talk about this diversity and, and different opinions. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that you know there's definitely going to be opportunities down the road. This is going to be the initial batch of applications, and the CRC is definitely going to be looking at the market demand and determining what changes are going to be needed 
regarding the number of licenses. Um, and also, I mean, right now, when you're looking at where to even, you know, place your operations, you're really limited. So waiting may even be the better route because right now, I think it's like 70% of New Jersey municipalities have opted out from the law, which means that you cannot uh, basically locate yourself, locate your business in that town. So hopefully now that towns have the regs, they'll slowly start opening up, but it may not happen right in this first round. Yeah, so for the for the the group here, I mean, we just talked about the fact that we need to be prepared, and and you're right, you know, maybe a little bit later, um, you might be able to get in on it. But what what does your team really look like? Who do you really need to be part of this team? And and um, you, from your experience, what works best? So anyway, yeah, and I'll yeah, and I'll start off again. I mean, so so similar to David, I mean, we 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 do a lot of this competitive application work. Uh, in a number of different states, right? And there's certain things that you almost see universal across the board. And that changes a little bit in adult, in adult use as they envision uh, new entrepreneurs entering into the marketplace. But but kind of the, the three things that you always wanna focus on are what town you're gonna look at, um, how you're gonna finance your your operation and what your team looks like. And and there's often a lot of overlap between the between those three, which is why I think they're kind of the universal truths. But, but certainly for New Jersey, I mean, one of the things that they like to see is that is that you have experience uh, in some form of a regulated industry, right? They recognize that not maybe not everyone, especially on the East Coast, will have experience in cannabis. But you know, I always say they they pick the phrase regulated industry because they want to know that you can listen to directions, right? That, that you know how to color within the lines, so to speak. So so that's where team building is really important from a fundamental level. You know, are, are there other ancillary industries that you can kind of paint the picture on your application to say, these are my team members, they've been in finance, they've been in insurance, they've been in healthcare, they've been in pharmaceutical. If they've been in cannabis, spectacular. Um, but, but the state, you know, part of the reason they do that is they wanna understand that when they give you one of these licenses in such a highly regulated industry, you know, again, to, to Todd's point, this is 160 pages of regulations and they apologize for it not being uh, descriptive enough. <laughs> they indicated at the meeting that they're, they're gonna need a refresher because there are certain aspects of those regulations that aren't fully fleshed out. Um, but but kind of conceptualizing who your team is from an experience standpoint um, will also lead into the financing standpoint, right? Because we know that these businesses are also, because they're, they're regulatory intensive, they're also capital intensive, right? So are you gonna raise that through your membership base through capital contributions, or are you gonna do third-party financing? Um, uh, the, your team can also help on, or also help or, or be detrimental when it comes to the location itself, right? So, so there's one class of licenses called the micro-business license, where 51% of your owners, officers, and employees have to be from the town you're located in or the immediately surrounding towns, right? Um, so in certain instances, uh, uh, you, you need that for your license class. But separate and apart from that, you know, New Jersey wants to see New Jersey in these applications, right? So, so there's bonus points for having folks who own 5% or equity, 5% uh, or equity or more in your, in your company um, who have lived in New Jersey for five years or more. And the more New Jersey you have in that, the more points that, that, that you're gonna get in that regard. So um, there's so much to think about your team, right? And, and I always say like, you know, even, even the multi-state operators, when they come into New Jersey on day one, they, they know they're not complete as a team. Um, and everyone should think that way. I mean, these aren't the type of licenses that go to one person. So, so Michael, I'm going to add something to that. And, um, and then I'm going to ask a question to Michael and to John, because I'd like to hear Valley Bank's view on this as well, too. And, Michael, I know you left the conference and there was a seminar I sat in yesterday, which I thought was very, inter very interesting when it came to micro licenses and funding and bank funding. So um, I think it's really important we talk about this. But one, that, one thing I want to add really quick. Also, when you look at your application in New Jersey, they, act, they ask about previous experience, not only in other sectors, but also in cannabis. And something to think about, if you invest in a company, a cannabis company in a different state, you get points for that, because that actually will help you a little bit with having that experience. So I just wanna add a little part, but the question I have for Michael, and the question I have for John Meyer at Valley Bank was, yesterday, they talked about micro licenses. And they talked about micro licenses five to seven years from now and how you have a cap 
on how much money you can really make with a micro license. And also, if we were to look at your performa and how things are shaken out if the, and the Safe Banking Act uh, passes, and if we get decriminalization occurring, and if some of these acts in our Congress occur, micro licenses are actually going to get hurt financially. So the question I have here, and, and, and John, I'd love to hear your opinion on Valley Bank on this, is that are the banks looking at micro licenses, maybe possibly now not being as good as an investment to give out loans for it? And Michael, I'd love to hear your opinion on that as well, too, because that was a very eye changer. And they really, and they brought in some, some different hedge funds yesterday. And, and we we're really going through the numbers five to seven years from now on how this could really affect the micro license industry. So John, I'd love to hear your opinion if the bank's looking at stuff like that. Uh, Michael, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. But this, some, there was a very hot topic yesterday that people don't like to talk about at all. Because micro yep. licenses may only cost you five hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars versus several million, but there's a limit on the upside. And then, what's the shelf life of actually being in that industry? So, sure, I'm happy to jump in uh, for the for the viewers out there. I'm John Meyer. I'm a commercial banker at Valley National Bank. Uh, we are headquartered in Wayne, New Jersey. I am uh, positioned in Fairfield, New Jersey. Uh, David, I think it's important for for the audience for me to take a step back really quickly on Valley's position and, and role in this in this marketplace, you know, as a whole, you know, finance is so broad, right? And when you look at the banking landscape, I think in general, you can say there are small, medium and large size banks, right? You've got your money centers, like the, the B of A's, the Wells Fargo's, you've got your mid-size like Valley and, you know, uh, US Bank, People's Bank, things like that. And then you've got your smaller, uh, local banks, uh, state chartered banks, credit unions, and ultimately, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone would accuse banks of being entrepreneurial most of the time. Um, but when it comes to cannabis, I think uh, I think there has been a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. And you know what what you have is it's no secret that you can find a bank to bank cannabis companies, but for the most part, it's been very localized and smaller scale because, as we all know. Cannabis is still illegal on a federal level, <clears throat> which makes it a lot more challenging for a valley, a mid-sized bank, or a money center bank to get involved um, because we are, you know, federally regulated. Whereas the state banks are adhering to state regs, and you know, in general, cannabis is on a state-by-state -state basis. So, what you have is, you know, hundreds of players in the in the financial institution landscape involved, but not many are of significant size. So, you know, a couple of years back, Valley looked around and said, you know, there's a lot of large cannabis players with a ton of liquidity and cash and nowhere to really put it other than to sprinkle it around state by state. So you've got what, you know, these MSOs, these multi-state operators, these publicly traded companies, which, you know, David's either run or is friendly with, um, and they're, they're in X amount of states in the country and they've got to develop banking relationships in each state. So it's a, it's it's probably quite a headache. So what Valley said was, you know, we're a national bank and if we do our homework, uh, we might be able to figure out a way to become a national banking opportunity, you know, a, a partner to these larger companies. So, <clears throat> you know, like everything in banking, it's it's know your customer. Uh, it's, 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 very, it's very much an oversight driven uh, opportunity and really, it's it's funny because I'm in the commercial lending space predominantly, um, and this this initiative was really spearheaded by people you wouldn't expect to be on the front end of entrepreneurial spirit. You've got you know your your AML and BSA folks, your compliance folks, your legal folks. They kind of drove this by developing a plan for our regulatory body uh, and really coming up with how we can bank these companies uh, safely, both for the bank and its shareholders. Uh, plus the the operator themselves. So you know we started out looking at the 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 bigger players because it was clear that those those larger players were likely going to have more transparency, more regulatory scrutiny. Uh, they were likely going to you know be very much sophisticated operators. So you know we we said that's probably our first crack at this is those who have hundreds of millions in cash that they don't have anywhere to park it. And if we can simplify their banking experience at one home instead of across, you know, 15 banks in 15 states, we thought that would be our entry to the market maybe ahead of our peers. 
So that, that's kind of the background on, on the bank and how we got involved. I can't really speak to the micro license aspect yet, David. Um, I'm sure someone within Valley could, and probably someone at the, uh, the tent or the table in Vegas can probably speak to that a little better. Uh, I might have to defer to Michael and more of a legal piece on that. But, you know, ultimately what we're looking at front and center is are, you know, if you're a cannabis company, are you properly licensed? Are you in good standing? Um, and, you know, so far when you're talking about cannabis companies, we've really only been in talks with the larger players. Um, and now that things are starting to open up, you're seeing a lot of, you know, commercial real estate owners, operators, they're looking at this as an opportunity to get a great lease with a cannabis company. So there's a lot of commercial real estate going on, uh, you know, tenancy going on. But uh, from, from where I sit, I can't really speak too much on the micro licensing aspect. So I'll turn that to Michael. Yeah, and look, I, I'll just add with Valley. I mean, I, you know, Valley is such a great team. You know, whether it's John, uh, Caroline Cologne, Todd Shear, Jen Yeager, that like it, they 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 legitimately have a superstar team when it comes to cannabis operations. And a lot of folks that I've known and worked with for a couple of years now. Um, you know, look, I you know I think on the banking side, it, it, a lot of that just comes back to bankable risk, right? I mean, do you, do you have property that serves as collateral? I mean, I, some of this is. You know, people think that cannabis is always reinventing the wheel. I mean, and, and as we get more to legitimacy, it's it's it, it kind of comes back to the same fundamental rubrics. But on, on the micro business side of things and the bankable risk, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing, you know, David, I, I love that you put out the number of like, what does it look like in five to seven years from now? Because the interesting thing that the, the, the reason that the interesting thing of how New Jersey is doing this is um, the micro business is the stepping stone. Right. So so just as we're talking about with banking and like it's it's just like any other business at any point in time. Right. Micro business licenses uh, provide theoretically and we'll have to see how it rolls out. But theoretically, uh, uh, and a somewhat easier pathway to licensure. Don't get me wrong. Like you still need to demonstrate to the state that, again, you're a good regulatory risk. Right. Like you're a good you, you, you have the bona fides to, to run a, a business cannabis business operation. But they're envisioning that it's going to be a different process than, say, seeking the 150,000 uh, square foot license, right? And the critical thing here, and this is where the timing is important, is there's this concept of micro business conversion, right? So, so micro business for anyone who, who might not know in the in the audience is it's basically yeah, it's what the name implies. There are operational limitations placed on the business. If you're a cultivator, no more than uh, uh, 2,500 square feet of culti of of canopy flower. Uh, I'm sorry, a flower canopy uh, on a 24 foot vertical plane. If you're a processor, no more than processing a thousand pounds a month, selling a thousand pounds a month if you're a dispensary and so on and so forth, right? So to David's point, at some point you have theoretically a revenue ceiling provided you're maxing out on er every relevant criteria. And, and the big question we had coming out of the statute was, well, how are they gonna condition that conversion when it comes to you've had a profitable year, you've had two profitable years, whatever it is. And I'll say this, similar to like getting in the industry with a micro business license, converting, at least on paper, the way the regs frame it, um, is not exactly onerous, right? Like, so some states will say, we wanna see that, that you've been uh, selling 80% of your inventory for two years, and then we'll consider it. What, what New Jersey is saying on the face of these regulations is like, hey, look, just show us that that you're you're at the point of getting close to um, your your operational max out or operational limits, and more importantly, show us how whatever next tier you're going to go up to, um, you know, why you have operational plans to make that make sense, right? So so in a certain sense, you know, David's right. I mean, at some point, federal legalization, federal liberalization is going to catch up. To a lot of these ancillary goals we have from a policy perspective, whether it's social equity, whether it's micro businesses or the like, you know, potentially the good news for our pr uh, protectionist uh, marketplaces is, you know, I do think that's far off, right? And, and, and we're not going to get safe banking unless it's tied to some meaningful decriminalization. Um, and then separately, like, you know, for New Jersey in particular, we got to be careful about having a marketplace where the borders on on the states come down tomorrow because if people from Oregon <laughs> can can outduel our New Jersey cultivators on price, we're not going to have a marketplace beyond dispensaries, right? So that's a another critical element that I know is on the minds of the Senate. But but the pathway, five to seven years, I mean, what New Jersey is saying with the micro business conversion in particular is 
hey, look, you run your you run your business, you run it successfully. Um, we're not going to be too onerous on you getting to that next phase and maybe getting some of that private equity money, even in advance of, of the regular banking coming down the line. So New Jersey is doing everything it can to kind of help the entrepreneur. Yeah, I uh, agree with what Michael's saying there. I mean, micro business licenses really are, I mean, intended to be the gateway into the cannabis industry. Gateway may not be the right words, the connotations there of cannabis, um, but it really is supposed to be that stepping stone into the, uh, the industry, and especially for New Jersey residents, because the micro business licensing is only for New Jersey residents. Um, micro business operator has to be owned 100% by New Jersey residents. And like Michael was saying earlier, um, it's limited to your town or neighboring towns. Um, so really is that stepping stone to bring New Jersey residents into the industry, allow them to get their foothold, get the foot in the door and really hopefully convert into that standard license and really operate within the states. Um, so it's really all about accessibility for New Jersey residents, I feel like, to really help them compete against more experienced operators from you know, other states. Well, and then I think we should also add something in here. And, and, and Michael, obviously feel free to, to chime in. And Todd, if we're spending too much time on this topic, pl please let us know. Okay. Uh, if, um, is one, we don't have a really too much of a caregiver act here in New Jersey compared to like the state of Maine. The state of Maine, a caregiver is someone where you can have so many patients and kind of have custom made medicine for patients. Um, the other thing is too, is that if we were to look at the history of micro licenses and be able to transfer them to larger operators, those rules and regs really aren't fully established yet. And I, I believe that's still correct, right, Michael? When it comes to transferring the micro, the micro licenses, New Jersey has not really talked too much about that yet when how, how it can be sold for the ownership and, and how, uh, what can happen. So the only reason I bring this up is that if we were to just put on our business hats and you're looking at what your exit strategy is for your business and you're going that micro licenses routes, you might not know exactly what your exit strategy could, could, could perfectly be at this exact moment. Um, if, I'm, if I'm slightly wrong on that, Michael, let me know. I just, I want to bring up that a lot of people are saying, oh, I can save a lot of money and I'm going to do a micro license instead. Yay, and save millions of dollars. And then it's, no, it's not that simple. So um, I just want to kind of spin up to all the viewers, uh, especially here in New Jersey that are listening, listening to this. Hey guys, just, just for before we, we move on, we are getting some questions in and, and somebody said they joined late and would like a definition of a micro business. So if someone could just give two seconds on the definition according to what the New Jersey regs are. Yeah, so so as, as Adam pointed out, 100% New Jersey residency in terms of owners. Um, uh, there's a geographic limitation, which is, and, and by the way, th th this is a, this is one of those ones that's somewhat surprising me coming out of the reg, right? So what the adult use statute said is that micro business licenses have to be, have to have 51% uh, of its owners, officers, or employees, right? Words matter or employees. What the regs come out and say is you need to have 51% of your uh, owners, officers, and employees coming from the town that you locate in, or the immediately surrounding town, right? And and that's a that's a huge limitation. I mean, think about any other business, right? If I'm a cultivator, if I'm a dispensary, like if I'm any other business, I want to attract the best talent because I want the best product. And it's this cat this policy catch twenty two that says we want to make sure the benefits of a license go to the local people, but at the same time, that does create an operational limitation that. You need to have that as part of your demonstration to the state. So again, before going on, off on a tangent on that, the other the other uh, operational limitations um, deal with kind of output, right? So if you're a cultivator, um, you can only cultivate uh, 2,500 square feet on a 24 foot uh, vertical plane. Uh, if you're dispensing, you can only sell a thousand pounds a month. If you're processing, only a thousand pounds a month. So so again, they're 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 viewing it as a as a kind of a, an, an intro license, a, a gateway license, so to speak, as Adam, as Adam put it. Um, and and uh, they're they're providing a, a, a theoretically a softer pathway to get that license. So just another question that came up, and, and I was surprised as I was reading the regs. Um, about edibles. I mean, 
anyone I talk to who goes to Colorado tells me about edibles in Arizona. And it, it seems like in the regs, they're going to limit uh, the the ability to to make edibles. I mean, a little clarity there would help. And um, is if you were planning to jump into to edibles, i.e. as a business, should you wait? This is what the question is. Should you wait for another round? Is there a possibility there'll be an expansion or is this a prohibition that is probably just going to stay in the ranks? That's that's the question that's raised by one of the folks who are listening for whoever wants to answer that. So I respond, uh, in an, uh, I saw that question, Todd, uh, in the chat room. I respond back very quickly. Um, I'm gonna take an investor relations viewpoint on this. Yes, do that. Not a legal viewpoint, but just purely investor relations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, every one of our clients who are based out of New Jersey that has manufacturing experience that wants to edibles has not applied for a license in New Jersey half of our clients that wanted to do something in manufacturing end up investing in another edible company in another state. And I bring that up is that, do we feel that the, the edible industry will eventually get developed in New Jersey? Yes. Do we feel that there's gonna eventually be maybe a federal regulation when it comes to dosage? Yes. If we were to look at time value of money, your money is better used elsewhere in other states in the manufacturing edible industry. And that's just purely an investor relations standpoint. That's not the rules and regulations standpoint. We look at time value of money and what's gonna be the best return on your investments. And as of right now, it's looking at other states for edibles. Will it eventually come in New Jersey? Yes, but we don't see that happening for at least another 24 months. So from what I understand, um, the CRC kind of talked about this a little bit, and Michael, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, basically they said these are the interim rules and regulations. They um, they looked into it. They felt like they didn't have the time and resources to really provide the regs in order to get them out by the required state deadline. Um, they did say they hope to get more regulations and information on edibles in future rules, but as of right now, that was not addressed, but they do plan to address that down the road. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just add, I mean, I, I think I think this 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 whole concept that like they're they're prohibited, I, I, I think that's a little bit overblown, right? So like if, if you if you look at the regulations themselves, there, there's not a regulation that says edibles are uh, de facto prohibit. I mean, Adam's right, right? So what, what, what they, they made some comments about having concerns as to, hey, look, like, do we need to involve like the Department of Health and food grade kitchen requirements and things like that? But, it, but if you look at, if you look at the regulations and on manufactured products, um, they're pretty broad. I mean, like, I think, I think one of the provisions talks about uh, ingestible forms, including chewable forms. Like I, you know, again, I, who the hell knows what that means, right? I think there's probably a larger policy backdrop to this, which is what what you know what you hear. You know, the whole thing with cannabis is you know think of the children, right? Like that that's always like the one refrain that that gets people really worked up and people get concerned on on the uh, on edibles for that reason because think of the children they can see a candy this that and the other, right? So like you know I if I'm a bet man I, I would say that's probably part of the policy backdrop to it. Um, but but two other things. One, one great thing about our regulations on the medical side, and they came over to the, the adult use side, is like we have this great rule called waiver. And, and basically it says that, you know, even if theoretically there was a prohibition under the regulations, you can waive, you know, you can petition to have a waiver for a specific product, right? So like, I don't think that I, I would, I, I think an operator could say, we have more and more patients coming in on a regular basis and here's the formulation and here's why it's safe. And you can still petition theoretically to make those products. They just have open questions there. Um, uh, but, but the other big thing too is like, to Adam's point, like think of the timeline, right? So, so these rules are interim rules for a year, right? Let, let's say for your max, let's say that you got a license, you apply in the next month for a manufacturing license and you got awarded a license by the end of this year it's going to take you a year to two years to get up and operational in the state of New Jersey as it is. Uh, maybe closer to a year if you're doing a, a smaller a smaller manufacturing license. But like, my point is this, right? Like, 
these are interim because they had a statutory deadline to rush to. They had to get them out in six months, right? So you can still apply. There are still a number of formulations that you can do on the manufacturing side of things. But like, never forget the value of your voice in these conversations. Like the value of experience, like people, uh, people like David in 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 other marketplaces where you know you can point to data points and say, hey, look, people need this. I mean, there's a lot of medical patients who will say. I need these types of products because maybe I live in an apartment complex where it's it's unlawful for me to smoke, right? Maybe it's just easier for me because this is the way I want to take my medicine, right? So like these data points, you just need to continue throwing them over to the CRC. Um, uh, but I would say, you know, again, the manufacturing reg came out. I would say it's pretty damn broad. They have their reservations, so we know where they stand on that. But even if you apply in the next month, it's it's going to take you some time, and and these rules may be. Uh, may be uh, completely gone as it relates to edibles by that point in time. We shall see. So um, I wanna throw another question out to the group here. Um, uh, question, do, it's an opinion, and David, I'd really love to hear your response. Is cannabis really gonna be that big in New Jersey? Is it gonna be really a big business? And um, if, if so, is there any competitive advantage to New Jersey compared to New York or Connecticut or some of the other states that are surrounding us? Or is this kind of be it's like anything else? It's really drummed up and it's not going to be a big business. Um, and I have a follow up question about investing in cannabis uh, businesses after that. But do we think it's really going to be that big or is it not? So um, I'm going to use valley bank as part of my answer for this if valley bank didn't think it was gonna be that big valley bank would not be involved in this okay um so there's a nice little plug for you john um but uh on a more serious note as i'm gonna answer in two parts i'm gonna tell you my own personal experience i always kept a corporate headquarters in new jersey but i had businesses in nevada uh colorado oregon maine People say, why, Dr. David, are you staying in New Jersey? Well, one, we are the only state that has four major metropolises in less than a four-hour time frame. Boston, New York City, Philly, and either you can say Baltimore or Washington, D.C. So therefore, you have all this overlap, especially when we haven't talked about even transportation issues yet. And what happens when decriminalization occurs and we start bringing product over the lines or over the state lines? But knowing where New Jersey is and how the East Coast is and being one of the original board members of the New Jersey Canna Business Association, you know, we're really in a unique place where we're in the most densely populated state in America. There's a need, there's a demand. We're in the pharmaceutical capital of the United States. There's going to be a need. There's going to be, uh, need to be, there will be a demand. Now, the second part of this is that Will New Jersey have a thriving cannabis business? Yes. Um, will New Jersey sit here and have, in my opinion, um, we're talking probably over hundreds of grows and dispensaries? In my opinion, the answer is yes. Okay. Because we'll have that need and we'll have that demand. When it comes though for the latter part, and, and um, I want other people to chime in about New Jersey, when it comes to investing, it really depends on what your goals are as an investor. If you want to do something in New Jersey, no matter what, then yeah, you're going to weigh New Jersey. And as of right now, in my opinion, you're going to overpay. Statistically speaking, when you look at how much it is to, uh, to enter the market in cannabis for the first time ever, New Jersey is on that top tier compared to every other state in the U.S., if not the highest one. I mean, I always joke around to either New York and New Jersey right now. So now why would you wait? four to five years just to get back your initial investments. When you can take that same money and time value of money, which you heard me say before, and go put it into other states. Go get experience in cannabis in other states. You know, once you become an investor in a company, they tend to lift, lift up the hood of the car. You can look in the engine. Um, a great example is we have several clients of ours who've done deals in Michigan just because they wanna do something out there. So is, a, is the opportunity here in New Jersey? Yes, it is. Is the opportunity to make some great money in the next two years in New Jersey? In our opinion, the answer is no. But is Canvas here to stay? It is. Will there be more opportunities down the road? There will be. Um, but I love to sit here and open it up. And like I said in the very beginning, someone like Valley Bank would not be involved in cannabis 
if they didn't see the the huge upside for us. Someone like Sachs wouldn't be involved in cannabis if you all didn't see you know the opportunity, especially here in New Jersey, where it can go. So when you see these larger companies getting involved, you know it's here to stay. Yep, and I can chime in on that, David. Um, you know, Valley National Bank is headquartered in New Jersey, but we are also uh, in, located in many parts of New York, every major market in Florida, uh, some major parts of Alabama, and we do have some national reach. So when I think our team has looked at the opportunities, I think it was predominantly outside of New Jersey to begin with. You have a lot going on in the Midwest, like Illinois, Michigan, uh, Florida. Um, so I think we believe it is here to stay and it'll probably circle back closer to home. Um, but so far, I think a lot of the major operators we're seeing uh, are probably looking at New Jersey down the road um, or maybe right about now planning an entry. Uh, but definitely uh, not front and center for right now compared to the, a lot of the other states in the country. But I'll just say, I mean, I, I think I think implicit in the question, too, is like is like, you know, and this is to David's point on, on the, the four major cities all around here. And, and I always I always kind of emphasize that by saying, too, like all highways lead through New Jersey. Right. When you're looking, you know, people call us the armpit. But I mean, the armpit connects the armpit connects the arm to the body and everything else. Right. So, like, I think implicit in the question is, like, what, what, what do the other states look like in terms of timetable? Right. Um, you know, New York may have gotten a little bit more of a boost now that Cuomo is out of office, right? Because you have a governor who may be trying to do a little bit more um, with the time that she has in office before she has to start thinking about reelection. Um, but, but you know, New York, New York's legislation, in contrast with New Jersey, doesn't have tight timelines like we did, right? Like our legislature said to the CRC, "You get up and running as quickly as possible." New York doesn't have that. Their statutes are extremely vague, and and the problem with vagaries, especially when you when you push it down to the um, to the commission level or the board level, is that it's going to take more time to flesh out what the marketplace looks like. But I, I think it's probably I, I I think we probably do have a two to three year time frame advantage on on these surrounding states of having a marketplace here that might not be um, that might not be elsewhere. And like the, the one thing I'll say, and this goes to David's point as well, right? Like, look, if you're if you're looking to make money in the next two years, like this is not the industry, right? I would most industries are not the industry, right? I mean, if you look at restaurants, they're losing endeavors before they, they even have a chance of winning, right? Um, and and you know, I, I often cringe when I when I when I hear the comment made about cannabis companies, um, you know, that, that that generational wealth, right? Look, generational wealth, if you work extremely hard, make a business, navigate all these issues as the industry pivots from state to federal and everything like that, like nothing's guaranteed in any industry. Certainly nothing is guaranteed um, uh, in New Jersey. Um, and it's all about sizing up the individual deals and, and understanding that, uh, you know, the, the, the roads aren't exactly paved with gold, no matter what the industry and, and no matter what your investment opportunity or, or your participation opportunity is in a business in New Jersey, you, to David's point, you want to lift the hood and get a little bit of, of a closer look on what the engine is engine looks like. And and candidly, that that's why you do have to turn to you know plug right plug for all of us right. But that that's why you do need to look to experts right because you know I, I can't tell you how many times I've been approached by folks and say, oh I spoke to so and such and they assured me they're a lock for a license. Let me tell you what, no one's a lock for anything in this industry, and that should be red flag number one. But but you want to go back to the fundamentals when you're approached with any of these types of opportunities. Some of it smells just from, from the get-go, but you, you want your accountants to look at what are the financials, or, or, or you want your advisors like, like David, or even a banking partner to look at what, what are the fundamentals of this business look like. You want to go to attorneys and say, like, what is the reality of what the regulatory environment looks like and what this opportunity looks like in the long term? But but so so I mean, you know. That's kind of my big takeaway with cannabis. Like it's a tremendous, you know, amount of work to run any of these businesses. There's no guarantee of success. And, and there are so many variables and that's not to dissuade people from the industry, um, but, ju but just to make sure that you, you walk into everything with eyes wide open. Yeah, I agree with, I mean, basically what everyone's saying, I mean, this is not gonna be a quick get rich scheme for people to come in and, you know, make buck and get out eventually. I mean, your expectations have to be in line that you need to put the work in. Um, there's gonna be winners and losers like in the, any industry out there, um, but someone's gonna be a winner. So 
you definitely want to be in there because this is a new booming industry. Um, people are going to succeed, but and then you think about down the road, like the other panels were saying, I mean, New Jersey's perfectly situated in the Northeast corridor. I mean, I'm a history fan, so New Jersey, we were the uh, crossroads of revolution. Everything comes in and out of New Jersey. So from that standpoint, in the long run, I mean, New Jersey companies are going to be greatly situated to really take advantage of once we get that federal legalization. So it has new meaning to the garden state, doesn't it? And, and yeah. the one thing is, and, um, and I know Michael can attest this, especially when you were probably speaking uh, the other day, is that the one thing, especially when we go to these campus events out here on the West Coast, and people have been in the industry for a while, is this is a full-time job. If you think this is going to be a second job for you, and you're just <laughs> going to get passive revenue, wake up. I'm sorry, this is not going to happen. This is a full-time gig. If you are truly looking, as Adam said, to like make this money on this and get the passive revenue, then become an investor. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, be an investor that has an advisory role. Uh, something we tell people all the time is, hey, depending on how much money you invest, you might be able to get a board seat as well too. So you can be active with the company's decisions without having to deal with the day-to-day -day operations. And it's just really important for you to realize that, okay, if you're going to do this on a part-time basis, there's a, there's a very high failure rate. And this is called spade a spade. The national average for a startup company is, for, for failure is 83%, which is high. And for cannabis, it's 97%. Think about that. 97% failure rate for startups. That's disgustingly high. So if you're thinking about doing this as a business owner, do you want to take that 97% risk and kind of see what happens? Or would you maybe want to take some money and put in something else and, and like the money work for you? And that goes back to what your goals are. What's your exit strategy? I know Michael talks about, you know, exit strategy. I know that, that Todd and Adam, when you're sitting here and you're dealing with clients and you're dealing with uh, the kind of side of things, you know, you're asking, hey, what's your three-year, four-year, five-year goal? You know, there are tax credits out there available, available for cannabis, which goes hand in hand on how you're developing your company as well, too. So the one thing that's even more imperative in this industry is you need to always look five years down the road and where you're going. So guys, just to, to mention a few other things, because there are a lot of questions that came in and uh, we're probably not gonna answer all of them. And, and thank you, it looks like David, you went in and actually answered people's questions. I might read some of them anyway for the purpose of this of recording, but someone did ask, is this being recorded? And the answer is yes. Will you get a copy of the recording? Yes, if you registered. Um, you will get a copy of this recording, so uh, don't, you know, don't worry. But um, one of the questions that was raised was um, the mention of the high cost of entry into the business in New Jersey, and this is for anyone. Are there cost estimates for a startup with a micro license? So uh, what's, what in your estimation would be a round number for a yeah, I mean, estimate? Look, I, I, you know, I, that, I would say that, that that's another common question we always get. Like, what, what does it cost, right? Like, what is it, how much money do you need to show and what does it cost, right? And, and the short answer is like, it, it, it all depends, right? And, and it depends on where is your company and what do you need, right? So, so remember, like, you know, I always say like the application process, this isn't the DMV. You're not putting your name and your date of birth and your address on there, right? So, so this is an industry that's all about disclosure. So you need to form your company. You need to have an operating agreement. Uh, if you're getting third-party lending, you need to negotiate what the terms of that financial agreement look like. Um, you need to have a you need to have a property, right? Like you don't need to have a f you need you don't need to formally necessarily be in a lease or own a piece of property. You can have an LOI or conditional purchase and sale agreement, but there's going to be a cost associated with that, right? You know, depending on the type of license you're going for. Uh, you might retain an application writer just to kind of maximize that opportunity and that speed to submission, right? Um, you know, you're going to have consultants, right? You might have a security consultant, right? Who's who's going to help you with the security plan and maybe do the build out. You might have your accountant do the do your um, uh, your business model or, or or things like that, right? So so there's no one size fits all um, when we're talking about this. Unfortunately, it's just about looking of what are the buckets of information I need. And how much money do I want to pay for all of that? Um, uh, and and things change substantially, right? I mean, again, if you own like a perfect retail 
uh, place and you don't have a you don't have a mortgage on it, right? Your costs are going to be less, right? If you applied in the 2019 application round and you're just trying to do a dust off of your application, your costs are going to be less. Um, but but it's all it's all it's all a factor of what you have and and what's going to be solicited on the application based on the statute and the regs and just seeing what those those buckets cost you. And Michael, is it safe to say it's going to make a big difference whether you're going into the cultivation side? Or the retail dispensary side, right? Um, you know, the cost of the building to to cultivate is is very capital intensive, versus you know, retail is going to be a fit up of a storefront potentially, but it's not going to be quite the square footage that cultivation would need. Hundred percent. I mean, again, you know, we're we're doing a, a natural thing in an unnatural environment. Like you literally have to, you literally have to, you know, play the creator and and create this universe inside of an industrial building. And and not every industrial building is right or perfect for that. And and to David's point, you talk about ninety seven percent fail rate. Like not having the right experts, especially on something like cultivation or or scientifically, um, you know, sci scientific heavy in terms of manufacturing or anything like that. Like that is the quickest way to fit into that 97% number. Assuming that just because, you know, you, you were aware of uh, folks who were, who, were, who were growing a plant or two in their basement in college, that that means that you can scale it out to 2,500 square feet, let alone 150,000 square feet. Like, you know, I, I, was, I always like the phrase uh, sophomore, right? The wise fool, right? Like you, you gotta be smart about what you know and smart about the fact that there's a lot that you don't know as well. And, and again, that comes back to team building, what we talked about earlier. No yeah. team's perfect. Realize where your weaknesses are. And, and then let's take this another step further. Being the IR guy, I, I'm gonna give you the very straight answer for money for a micro license. I tell people the best business plan I've ever seen for a micro license in New Jersey was about $600,000. And that is the bare, bare minimum. But that was someone who came from California, had growing experience, knew what they were doing, and their performance was on, was on point. If they went to, to someone like Saks, they, they could see, okay, the numbers are really tight, but yeah, you get this done. High number, I tell people we're looking at about $1.5 million for a micro license. Because if you don't know what you're doing between the architect, bringing in a team, because remember, when you're doing a micro license, it's a very, very tight staff. Very, very, some staff. Michael already talked about the rules and regulations about where you have to live and where your employees have to come from, which limits you even more. You know, we talk about someone like John over at Valley Bank. When they're looking at business plans, they're going to see a variation of almost 100% difference. And it's going to be very common because it goes back to really the experience as well as, you know, how much help do you really need? So for us, we tell people if you're going to do a micro license, we're looking between $600,000 and $1.5 million overall. And everyone here, uh really comes back to okay we all see different aspects of the industry and then someone also asked about testing labs yes testing labs will be needed in in new jersey as someone that used to own several testing labs it's a, it's a huge demand but the next question is how much do you usually need for a testing lab and on the low low end you need usually at least four million dollars minimum five million to play it safe but you know these are the numbers we're talking about you know we're not talking about a million dollars or so forth and so on um so that's all kind of food for thought for everyone. And yeah, this is and really David. where, oh, go, go ahead, Adam. Okay, I was gonna say, this is really where, you know, proper budgeting and forecasting really comes into play. You really need to know what your costs, what your budgeting are gonna be for the application, but then you're also gonna have costs if your license is approved, your costs get up and running, and then when you are up and running, there's no certainty you're gonna be cash flow positive in the beginning. You're gonna have additional costs. So that's more capital that you're gonna need up front. So really you need to have a plan in place so you know how much capital you really need to have to really be sustainable. And, and taking another step that. further, Adam, I think, well, and this is where, you know, this is something that you guys do very well, Adam, is that, you know, when, when you're looking going after investors, you have your best case scenario, your average scenario, your worst case scenario. Um, out here uh, in Las Vegas at the Canvas Conference, um, whether it's a financial institution, whether it's the lawyers, whether it's hedge funds, we all have, everyone had the same joke. Oh, I'm going to grow and I'm going to have a hundred percent success rate. Excuse my language, but that's bullshit. It's a crop. You're going to have some crop that doesn't go well. You're not going to have some stuff that doesn't test very well. And on top of that too, just because you can grow all this cannabis doesn't mean you're able to unload everything. And I think the most interesting story we heard so far was 
there was a hedge fund and they joined. got a, a round and there was a state on the east coast i won't say which state and they said how much they could grow and their reaction was so you're telling me that every one of your potential buyers is going to buy 2.1 ounces every single time they come in and you're going to do that six days a week to hit your pro your to, to, to max out your sales so kind of this food for thought on that you know you got you got to be a, a little bit realistically on that so you definitely need to be realistic. I mean, you can't go in with this rosy picture because nothing ever works out the way you intend. So you really need to have different paths going forward, different plans, like you're saying, David, because like you're saying, I mean, there's no, nothing's ever 100%. You're going to come off across with issues. Your best case scenario is not going to happen in most cases. And you're also, you're also not going to have traditional finance as an option as you start this up. It's gonna be private hedge fund, uh, you know, no bank or government, in, you know, financial institution is gonna get into this on the ground floor. So, you know, when you look at Valley, yes, we're, we're in the space as far as banking goes, but when you're talking about financing, that's a whole nother thing because, you know, look, every, every legal business we bank is depositing the same type of thing. It's cash or coin. Um, however, on the lending side, when you're talking about you know, business assets and collateral, you know, we like real estate, we like accounts receivable, we like inventory and equipment. We don't necessarily love cannabis quite yet as our as our collateral. So the lending side is far trickier than the banking quote unquote side where, you know, to go back on, you know, Valley's core strategy, it was, it was a deposit play because there's so many established companies that have a lot of cash. Um, and then on the, on, on what you guys were touching on, on keeping this thing afloat, you know, where, where I am used to being a great partner to businesses is on like working capital, uh, you know, ongoing needs where that's, <clears throat> that's going to be a, tr a, a real tricky part of the equation until it's federally legal, you know, to get a, a true banking partner. So we have a few minutes left, guys. Just have a quick question. And I think that this is one that maybe, Michael, you can shed, sh shed some light from the federal perspective. What's happening and what now, what should New Jerseyers be looking at from the federal perspective? What What's coming down the road is, you know, well, I'll just let you answer the question. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, right? So, so the first thing that you should be aware of is um, the Senate is soliciting comments on the bill that's out there by September 1st, right? So, so for anyone who's kind of looking down the line, um, there's a couple things that, you know, I think, I think the, there's a couple of good things, a couple of bad things, right? So, so we want to see uh, uh, tax code reform. So, another thing that that we haven't talked about yet was was, you know, it might be implicit is this whole 280e compliance, right? That you can't take if you're a cannabis business, talking about being cash flow positive, but your effective tax rate is you know anywhere between 80 percent and higher, right? Because you can't take standard business deductions. That's a problem. Right. So at least on the state level, we have Senator Singleton, who has presented a bill that that might give state tax level relief on that. But but that's going to be an issue until we get something at the federal level. Um, uh, decriminalization, obviously, we need that in the worst way. And, and, and Senator Booker has made clear um, that we're not going to have these business level. Um, we're not going to have this business liberalization unless it's tied to something more robust. But, but for New Jerseyans, well, let me cut straight to the, the punch, right? So, so I, I don't think we see an omnibus federal bill for, I don't think we see it in the first term. I mean, I, I, I preface that by saying, uh, you know, at the start of this year, I said, I said, no way New York legalizes this year. And then, and then sure enough, within two months, they legalized, right? So, but I, I don't think we see anything in the first term. But, but the one thing that anyone who's looking to get inside, into this industry needs to be concerned about from the federal level, and that's silent currently in the federal bill, is, is there a twilight period of these federal marketplaces, right? There's so much that goes into this concept and this goal of the micro business to allow people to scale the right way. There's so much that goes into our social equity priority process of, of getting folks who have, been, uh, who, who, have, who have been hit worse by, by the prohibitionist era into the industry and potentially reaping some of the fruits of it. But, but I tell you what, without a twilight period that, that protects these individual state marketplaces, especially in the Northeast, you know, even without a phase seven to 10 year twilight period protecting these marketplaces, 
um, it's going to be disastrous for for entrepreneurs like 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 those in New Jersey. So, you know, I, my big takeaway and and you know, people often overlook this is like stay involved in government, right? I mean, the best thing about the federal bill is you know we have Senator Booker, our senator, who who is who is championing these issues. So you want to stay engaged with with him on the, those issues, just like you want to stay engaged with the CRC about what you want this marketplace to look like, irrespective of what's in the 160 pages of regulations that came out uh, a week ago. 164, Michael. Oh, okay, my apologies. I my, I didn't read those four. <laughs> listen, listen, guys, we are um we're we're out of time, but we, you can see um on the slides is everybody's contact information. Also, a, we're opening up a special email address, saxcannabis at saxllp.com. For those people whose questions were not answered, we will get those answers to you. We'll send them to you. And I want to thank Dr. David, John, Adam. Michael, and I'll even thank myself um, for being on the panel. Uh, we're going to be doing this regularly as we go through this journey. So these folks will be back on again. And also, I think that there's a right here on this slide, there is a, a giveaway, if I'm not mistaken. Adam, can you read it? Because my screen is actually blocked. So this is the uh, budget and forecasting guide um, going over what challenges and what issues you really need to tackle and face as an emerging canvas business. Um, so you could go ahead and download that at saxllp.com backslash canvas. Right. So guys, thank you so much for being part of the panel. It was a very lively discussion. Love it. We're going to do it again and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. I know David, you're out in Vegas and I see the rest of us are all in Jersey. We're very jealous. Or maybe you're jealous of us. I don't know. So take care and have a great day. Great Thank to you, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, everyone. Signing off.